Welcome to worship today at Ebenezer Presbyterian Church. It's good to have all of you here, and especially I want to welcome any guests and visitors who have come and joined us today. We are very thankful to have you in this time of worship. Would you please take the friendship pads that are on the outside of the rows, and if you would fill in the information they asked for, and if you'd send it down the rows so that others have an opportunity to do the same, that would be greatly appreciated. If you are a guest today for the first time on your way leaving the sanctuary through those doors and over to the left-hand side, your right, uh, there's a table there with some packets of information. And if you're looking for a church home, you may find that information helpful if you are uh, considering Ebenezer. A few announcements that I want to point out in our bulletin. First, uh, we uh, want to celebrate with Colton and Tara, uh, Sarah Tucker at the birth of their new son, Brooks Colton Tucker, uh, who was born earlier this week. And from what I understand, uh, mom and dad and uh, the little one are all doing well. So we celebrate with them. Our rose here in the front is in honor of uh, their, their son, Brooks. Also, please uh, take note that next Sunday we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and uh, take time this week to prepare yourself for coming to the Lord's table. Uh, the other announcement that I want to point out to you is the insert to your bulletin for Ebenezer Mission Focus Dinner. I think an announcement was made about this last week and an announcement this week. It's coming up on August 7th. It's going to be the team from uh, Rwanda that recently returned and they're going to give us an update on the things that they were a part of their ministry uh, there uh, during that week. And so if you plan to come and be a part of that, please fill out that in uh, information there, put it in the offering plate, or you can use the QR code uh, just as easily. Pretty soon, we are going to be starting back with our choir here at Ebenezer, and to say a word about that, I'd like to invite Elizabeth Mixon to come up. Good morning. Uh, before I talk about choir, I want to talk about one other thing related to singing. Um, on Sunday evening, August 18th, we will have a hymn sing in here, followed by a homemade ice cream social. We'll begin here in the sanctuary with the hymn sing at 5 o'clock. This is a Sunday evening, after which we will move to Bailey and enjoy ice cream made and served by our own deacons and elders. You will even get to submit your vote for your favorite. Ooh, yeah, I heard that. Um, for those who cannot eat ice cream, I say, I am so very sorry. <laughs> but come anyway, enjoy the singing and enjoy the fellowship. To those who do not like ice cream, I say, I just don't understand. Uh, in all seriousness, we hope everyone will come. Please mark your calendar now. Reserve the date and time, August 18th, starting in here at 5 o'clock. We want everyone from our youngest child to our most seasoned adult to be here. It will be a wonderful time. Uh, now, as Matt mentioned, um, our second and sooner upcoming event is the restart of our chancel choir after a bit of a break, and I'm very excited about this. When our family moved our membership to Ebenezer, um, or when we visited before we moved our membership here, one of the first things that caught our attention was the robust singing of this church not just up here, but the congregation. And I look so forward to the choir helping to lead in worship again through song. Now our first rehearsal is next Wednesday night, August 7th. Um, and because of the mission meal at six, this particular rehearsal will start at seven but following that, our Wednesday night rehearsals will start at 6.30. Now, if you look in your bulletin, if you will, please, turn to the page that has the church calendar at the top. You'll see at the midway down, 
an announcement about choir. Uh, the heading says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. And that's Psalm 96.1. So if you look there, you will see that I have listed three prerequisites for singing in the choir. The first two are self-explanatory, the desire to praise the Lord through song, faithful attendance at Wednesday rehearsals and on Sunday mornings. But I have learned that my listing of the ability to match pitch has had some folks scratching their heads. Now this is not a mysterious term. Basically it means you can sing back a pitch provided for you. You match it. You don't sing higher, you don't sing lower, but you sing the same pitch. Now, I toyed with the idea of having Matt be my demonstration assistant, <laughs> but later thought better of that. So, Mel. <laughs> How about that? Just kidding. Instead, Instead, I'm going to demonstrate for you very briefly. I'm going to ask Kathy in a moment to play a pitch. I'm going to hear it, and I'm going to match it. My aim is not to sing higher and not to sing lower, but to match it. So, Kathy, if you'll give me A flat. La. Same pitch. Didn't sing higher, didn't sing lower. Now give me a C. La. Same pitch. Not, high, uh, not higher, not lower. Now it's your turn. And I'm serious. If you know me, you know I will not sit down until you do it. All right, so I'm going to ask Kathy to play a pitch, and I'll even help you out. I'm going to sing it first, and then I want you to take a good breath and sing it back to me, and you just sing la like I did. So an A. So I'm going to do it. La. Your turn. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So there you go. Now turn to your neighbors and tell them how they did. Again, just kidding, just kidding. Don't really do it. No, no. If you would like to explore the opportunity, the possibility of singing in our choir, please see me or email me. I do want to make sure we have enough copies of music on hand as we prepare our voices to sing praises to our Lord. And we have a good time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Let's take a moment now and prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
Will you stand with me for the call to worship? From Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Let's pray together. Eternal God, you are great and you are greatly to be praised and your glory fills both heaven and earth. We too join the psalmist in worship by singing a new song, which is the song of our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our King. And we joyfully declare your wondrous works, both in saving us and in sustaining us by your providential care. Gather us, we pray, into your presence. Come, Holy Spirit of God, and fill us that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn today is from the Psalter. It's an insert to your bulletin. We'll sing from Psalm 96, 1 through 8. Oh, sing a new song. may be seated. The wonder and majesty of our God is an amazing thing, but his holiness, his purity, his his majesty is beyond knowing. Bible recounts that he is like a refiner's fire. And so we approach this holy God even now, remembering his own admonition that before all the people, I will be counted as holy. So I'll ask you just now to turn your attention to the prayer of confession there on the left-hand side. We'll make that our own in a moment, but now let's close our eyes, bow our heads, spend a minute or so in quiet confession, and then I will lead us in this prayer of confession. Let's pray together.
Let's pray together. Lord God, we confess that we are lawbreakers with no righteousness of our own to stand before you. We have repeatedly presumed upon your grace and viewed it as a license to sin. We have disparaged holiness while mimicking this corrupting world and its ungodly ways. Will you please forgive us? Will you subdue our corruptions and grant us grace to live above them? Purge us from every false desire, every base aspiration, everything contrary to your rule. Deliver us from every habit and thought that prevents us from taking delight in you. Grant us never to lose sight of the heinousness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, the exceeding glory of Christ, the exceeding beauty of holiness, and the exceeding wonder of your grace. We ask this in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. Our assurance of forgiveness this morning is from the New Testament book of Colossians, the third chapter. Listen to these words and let them fill you with hope. The Apostle writes, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Well, as we let those words seep in, and as we enjoy the fact that by God's own proclamation, we are forgiven in Christ. I'll ask you to take your hymnal again. Turn to page 254, if you would. And let's join our voices as we stand in singing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. 254. You may be seated. In 
In just a moment, Charles and Alyssa Hardy will be presenting their son, Theo, for the sacrament of baptism. When we look at the scriptures, we see God's pattern is to relate to his people by way of covenants. The Lord has declared over and over, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so it was that God called Abraham to trust in him and gave him the covenant sign of circumcision to show that he belonged to God. In baptism, which is the new covenant sign, God now claims us in Christ. He marks us as his own people and he seals our membership in Christ's covenant community, the church. Baptism is the covenant sign that through faith we are freed from the power of sin and death and united to Christ in his death and resurrection. By the Holy Spirit, we are washed clean of our sins, and God calls in baptism. His call in baptism is for us to give ourselves over to him in faith and love and new obedience. From the beginning, God has graciously included our children in his covenant. All God's promises are for them as well as for us. We are to teach them that they have been set apart by baptism as God's own children so that as they grow older, they too may respond to him in saving faith and obedience. And so Charles and Alyssa are presenting their son Theo this morning for baptism as a sign of his inclusion into God's covenant family, the church. And they do so in faith that as they raise him in the way of our Lord Jesus Christ, God in his mercy will grant to Theo the gift of saving faith and in doing so confirm the promises that God is making here today. You're welcome to come up and join Pastor Mel. Charles and Alyssa, we rejoice this day with you and the whole of your family as you bring young Theo uh, to identify him by way of these waters with the covenant mark of God's people. And so to that end, I would ask you these covenant vows. Do you now both acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit, do you? Also, do you claim and trust in God's covenant promise in his behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do for your own, do you? You now unreservedly grant or give, rather, your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example, that you will pray with him and for him, that you will teach him the doctrines of our holy religion, you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, do you? And to you, the congregation, do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting Charles and Alyssa, the parents of Theo, in the Christian nurture of this child? If so, say, I do. What is the Christian name of this child? Theodore Benjamin Hardy. Theodore Benjamin Hardy. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and dwell within you now and forevermore. Let's pray together. Our great and wondrous God, even he who grants life to us, 
We pray now for your blessing to rest upon young Theo. Grant, even as he finds himself within these halls, hearing the name of Christ magnified, that the work of the Holy Spirit would occur in his heart very early, that he would be regenerated unto faith, that he would come to name Christ Jesus as his own, and that in all things he would grant to Christ his glory. Bless Charles and Alyssa even as they raise this young one and grant to them wisdom that they might know best how to encourage him in his faith, strengthen him in that profession, that all might be done to the glory and honor of Christ, our King who saves us. And this we pray in his mighty name. Amen. Well, now let's join together in a time of prayer. Pray with me if you would. Our Father and our great God, you who mark us as your own, and you who grant to us a testimony of grace, we thank you for all that you have done by way of your goodness to us. Your prophet Micah has shown us the wonder of your nature when he is declared who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? And Father, how we thank you that in your mercy we are counted as your own, your heritage. And while our iniquity marks us, it does not make us. For we thank you that by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have broken the power of canceled sin. You have set the captive free. You are that faithful God to all who will place their trust in you, and we cannot compare another to you, for you are the living and true God. There is none besides you. The truth of your judgment, O God, stands against all others. Lord, we recognize that our debt before you is great, but we rejoice even now, again, as we have confessed our sins before you, and the blood of Christ has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. We pray that we would hear the admonition of your spirit even as he speaks through the writing of the pen of John the Apostle encouraging us to walk in the light even as Jesus is in the light. And as we do so, the blood of that one crucified for us will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But our Father, gracious and good to your people, we also hear Micah proclaiming to us that you do not retain your anger forever, but you delight in mercy, that you will again have compassion on us, and you will subdue our iniquities and cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. We pray even as this reality takes root in our heart, that we would be a people that would live in joy of that proclamation of holiness over us, that the righteousness of Christ is ours by faith, and that you have made provision for us at every sector. We thank you, Father, with hearts full, even this day, for our own faith, which is an evidence of your goodness to us, of the Holy Spirit, his presence and power at work within us. We give you thanks for family and friends. We give you thanks for every provision, even in this week, where you have filled our mouth with good things and satisfied us with so many creature comforts. We thank you for the testimony of this church, Ebenezer Presbyterian, within this community. We pray it would grow strong even in the days to follow. Grant us strength that we might walk in obedience to the direction of your holy word. Grant us boldness that we might declare the gospel without shame or timidity. Grant us wisdom for the living in this age. And Father, even now as we anticipate that there are those not among us who perhaps struggle with discouragement, even despair, we ask, O oh Father, that you would encourage their hearts and return them to us, raise them up from whatever malady that they suffer under, and grant to them the hope and assurance that you are with them no matter the situation. 
We thank you that you are a God who hears our prayers because of the Lord Jesus, whose righteousness we possess by faith. And we thank you that that grace which you grant to us will never fail, even now as we have brought this prayer before you, trusting that all will be done and accomplished according to your will, which is gracious and good on our behalf and to your great glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've got a four-year-old or a kindergartner and they're going to children's church, I'm going to ask you to dismiss them now, and our workers will join them as they exit the sanctuary. In addition, I'm going to ask you to prepare God's tithe and any additional offering you might like to give as an act of worship this morning. And as you're reading both those tithes and offering, our ushers will be coming forward. And then I'll ask you, lastly, to look inside your bulletin to the side opposite of the psalm that we just sang. And on that opposite side, you'll see the song, Speak, O Lord. And let's join our voices together in worship. You may remain seated. Amen. Please take out your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to focus today on verses 12 through 16. Philippians 3, 12 through 16. You can find that on page 981 if you're using the Pew Bible. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, as faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word, we ask that you would open your word to us now in this time of preaching. Let us not be passive, but prompt us by your spirit to actively engage these scriptures and by them bring salvation to those who are strangers to your grace and sanctify your people as you grow us through this means of grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
If you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's holy word. As Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes, beginning in verse 12, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. You may be seated. I recently read an interview with pastor and theologian Sinclair Ferguson in which he was asked, if you could only recommend to your congregation five books to read other than the scriptures, what would those books be? And out of all the books that have ever been written, one of the five that he recommended was Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. You've heard me stress many times over the years the value of this book, which I know many of you have read. Ferguson said he believed that if more people read Pilgrim's Progress, there would probably be less need for Christian counseling. Bunyan, of course, wrote Pilgrim's Progress during his 12-year imprisonment in the Bradford Jail. He was there because he refused to stop preaching the gospel. And the book takes the form of an allegory of the Christian life in which the people and the various events point to deeper meanings beyond the story itself. And so the main character is a man named Christian who as a result of reading a book, the Bible, is convicted that he needs to leave his home behind in the city of destruction and he sets out in pursuit of the celestial city which is heaven. Along the way he meets various people including evangelist, Mr. Worldly Wise Man, Mr. Legality, the interpreter, formalist, hypocrisy, his traveling companions, faithful and hopeful, and even a giant named Despair. The journey also takes him through many trials, including the Swamp of Despond, the Hill of Difficulty, the Valley of the Shadow of Death, and the City of Vanity Fair where he is persecuted. At last, though, the book comes to a close with Christian finally crossing over the river of death and reaching Emmanuel's land. Now, again, Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory of the Christian life. From the moment that a person first hears the gospel and responds to the gospel in faith to the very end when they at last set foot in the kingdom of heaven. But notice the title of Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress. His title reminds us of what the scriptures teach us over and over and over, and that is the true Christian life is one that is marked by progress, by advancement, by growth. In a sense, a spiritually static or regressing Christian, also called backsliding, is a contradiction because a true disciple of Christ is one who is continually growing in grace, being shaped, being formed into the likeness of Jesus. And isn't that God's plan for every single believer without exception? Most of us find great comfort in Paul's words from Romans 8, 28, where he writes, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. But have you ever asked the question, what is his purpose? Well, Paul answers that in the very next verse. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That is God's purpose. That is his plan for all whom he has sovereignly predestined for salvation in Christ. And that is his plan for you too, if you look to the Lord Jesus in faith. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, Paul tells us, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. God's design for you, God's design for me, is that we should be holy unto him. And the believer's sanctification is comparable to, to a seed that is planted in the soil and grows into a full, mature plant. Thomas Watson said that the believer's sanctification is still increasing like the morning sun, which grows brighter to full noon. And so a true believer will continually assess him or herself and ask the questions, are my interests reflecting the interests of Christ? Do I love the things that Christ loves? Do I hate the things that Christ hates, and most especially my own sin? Is the fruit of the Spirit, those characteristics of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, are these qualities, are these characteristics increasingly prevalent in my life? Do the means of grace in God's word and sacrament and prayer, which coalesce in the Lord's day worship, are these an increasing priority in my life? Those are all necessary questions for us to ask ourselves on a routine basis. Well, Paul understood the progressive nature of the Christian life and from our text this morning, we can glean six truths about the believer's new life in Christ, what we call sanctification. And let's take a couple of minutes, a few minutes to look at them. First, we see in Paul himself that the Christian life is imperfect this side of heaven. It is imperfect this side of heaven. Paul writes in verse 12, not that I have already attained this, or am already perfect. The same Greek word that's translated as perfect here is translated in verse 15 as mature. It describes something that has reached its completion, has reached its stated goal. In one sense, it describes the outcome of the Christian life. And Paul is saying, in no way have I reached this. In no way have I arrived. Perfection characterizes the believer only when he or she has at last reached the goal of our salvation and is glorified by God in heaven. And even then, there is one more step, which is the bodily resurrection, verse 11 when Christ returns. And so Paul adds in verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. And I don't know about you, but I find Paul's words here to be oddly encouraging, comforting to me. In our constant and ongoing struggle against our sin nature, Paul is helping us to set our expectations correctly and preparing us for the fact that none of us will achieve perfection in this life. That awaits us in the life to come. And by implication, what that means is the church is not a place for perfect people. The church is a hospital where sick sinners find the medicine, the remedy of forgiveness in the gospel of Jesus Christ and are equipped by the Holy Spirit to walk in faith and obedience. And this need to be, needs to be part of the message that we communicate to unbelievers. Too often, those outside the church think, because they're hesitant, they think, 
those people inside the church, they, they have their lives all together. Everything fits together in their lives so nice, so neatly, but that's not my life. My life is a mess. I know that I'm not living as God would want. So let me get my life straightened out, and then I'll come to church. Of course, there are two errors there. First, you and I don't get our lives right and then come to Christ by way of his church. We come to Christ by faith, and according to his grace working within us, he empowers us with both the desire and the ability to walk in newness of life that pleases him. And the second error is believers don't still struggle with sin. If you were Baptists, I'd ask you for an amen at this point. Christians, too, have difficulties in their marriages, struggle with worldly temptations, and have anxious thoughts about the future. And to that point, the church must be a place of authenticity, a place where people can be honest, where they can be real, where they can acknowledge their daily battles with sin and their ongoing need for God's grace. I recently came across a quote from Ebenezer Erskine that I found helpful. He writes, The life of faith is a continual coming to Christ, and a receiving out of his fullness grace for grace. Grace received into the vessel of the soul will, like water, soon stagnate by reason of the corruption of the vessel and will soon be spent. What we get this day will not serve us in the next, and therefore there must be a continual application to him for a new supply. Kind of reminds me of the man in the wilderness, enough for the day, we go back and we go back and we go back and find his grace. No matter how far advanced a person may be in his or her faith, we never grow beyond our daily dependence on God's grace. We simply dive deeper into it as we bring the burdens of our sins to the foot of the cross and receive a new Christ's assurance that his sacrifice has made atonement. Christian, Life will always be imperfect this side of heaven, and therefore we must continually look to Christ. Second, the Christian life requires effort on our part. It requires effort on our part. This point has already been made multiple times in this letter to the Philippians, so I don't want to belabor it. But Paul does write in verse 12 here, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. In verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Obviously, these two words, press on, imply effort. They imply exertion on Paul's behalf. There are some in the church today who argue that to suggest that the Christian life requires effort on our part is dangerous because it might promote legalism or self-righteousness and diminish the value of God's grace alone to save and sustain us. And while I certainly appreciate the desire to uphold God's grace so that he alone is glorified, we don't want to neglect what is clearly taught in the scriptures. And that is a believer's growth in Christ's likeness does not occur apart from strenuous effort. As Paul has already stated in chapter 2, verse 12, we work out, not work for, but we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And yet we do it always remembering that we're only able to do so because God is the one who is first working in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. An imperfect analogy is an automobile. In order for a car to move, the engine must work, but in order for the engine to work, it must have what? Fuel. It needs gasoline. Otherwise, it is powerless. 
A believer is like an engine that must work in order to grow toward maturity, and the Holy Spirit provides the fuel that empowers the work. I think I've heard Mel say it before, we cannot grow in the Christian life without the Holy Spirit's power, but we will not grow in the Christian life apart from our effort. Friends, if you're a believer, you will desire to grow in holiness because the Holy Spirit now indwells you. But your pursuit of holiness is not so that God will accept you. God has already accepted you in his Son. Like Paul, you will press on in your pursuit to make the fullness of your salvation in Christ your own because Christ has already made you his own. Remember, God has predestined you for the purpose of being conformed to the image of his Son. In Ephesians 1.4, Paul assures us that every believer who has been chosen in Christ was chosen before the foundation of the world that we should be holy, that we should be holy and blameless before him. That outcome is already certain because Christ has already made you his own. That issue was decided in eternity past when God chose you as well as your outcome. And so Paul writes in Philippians 1.6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to its completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Third, the Christian life is intentional. It is intentional. In verses 13 and 14, Paul says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul was not aimless. He was not haphazard in his approach to the Christian life. He was intentional, even single-minded in his pursuit. But one thing, he said. As Warren Wearsby notes, one thing is a phrase that is important to the Christian life. In Mark 10, 21, Jesus said to the rich young ruler who was confident of his own self-righteousness, Jesus said, you lack one thing. To Martha, who criticized her sister Mary for listening to Jesus' teaching instead of helping her clear the dishes, Jesus said in Luke 10, 42, one thing is necessary. After Jesus restored the sight of the blind man, In John 9, 25, the man declared, one thing I know. And in Psalm 27, David testified, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after. I believe that perhaps the greatest hindrance to modern day Christians, especially in the West, is our busyness due to misplaced priorities that distract us from that which is most important. One person said, if the devil cannot make you directly sin, he'll make you busy. Another person adds, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. How many Christians today have become scattered in their focus and their attention, going to school, pursuing careers, earning money, raising a family, enjoying hobbies, and so on? Is it any wonder that we're told in James 1.8, a double-minded person is unstable in all of his ways? How many does that describe today? Quite possibly some who are here. Do you ever feel like that guy who is spinning the plates and he's running from plate to plate trying to keep spinning them so that they don't stop and fall off and 
as soon as one begins to wobble, he has to run over to that one and get it spinning again, and then he has to go over to this one. And he's just chasing the plates back and forth. That's all he's doing. Sometimes it feels that way. Paul said, one thing I do. And it's not that the other things I mentioned are wrong. It's certainly not sinful to go to college or to have a career or a family or a hobby. But those are not the one thing. They are not the main thing. They are simply the avenues in which we demonstrate the priority of the one thing that matters most. And that is the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That prize is the fullness of our salvation in Christ being confirmed or conformed to him in the age to come, free from sin, fully glorified and joining in perfect fellowship with him forever. That is the goal that Paul pursued with single-minded devotion, which then gave shape to how he lived the rest of his life in the present and the other areas of his life that were important to him. Fourth, the Christian life is focused on the forward, forward focus. Paul writes in verse 13, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. How many runners leading in a race have turned to look back to see those who were behind them only to stumble or find somebody pass them on the side while they were looking away. No one effectively runs forward while looking backwards. That's why Paul focused on the road ahead and not on the ground he had already covered. How do we sometimes focus on the past? Well, sometimes we do it by holding on to our sins and our past even after we have given them to Christ and we have been assured of his forgiveness. We allow the enemy to accuse us and condemn us even though Christ has borne the penalty for our sin and set us free. Sometimes we also hold on to the past by focusing on our accomplishments and the good things that we have done. When that happens, we easily become prideful and self-righteous. Paul wants us to avoid both of these errors. He didn't despair for his sins of the past, which were many, because Christ had forgiven him. And he did not become boastful of his accomplishments in the past, which were many, because he knew that they could not save him. Only the righteousness of Christ could. And so he kept pressing forward toward the goal that lay ahead. We cannot look back while at the same time keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Someone once asked the great missionary David Livingston when he was back in England briefly after having worked for so many years in Africa. They asked him, well, Dr. Livingston, where are you ready to go now? And Livingston responded, I am ready to go anywhere provided it is forward. And so it must be in the Christian life. Fifth, the Christian life, or the Christian rather, never loses sight of the prize. Never loses sight of the prize. Paul writes, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I know I've shared this illustration this account before, but I'm going to do it again. Uh, I think some of you have heard of Florence Chadwick. She is the first woman to swim the English Channel in both directions. On July 4th, 1951, she attempted to swim from Catalina Island to the California coast. And the distance was not the difficulty so much as it was just the, the bone-chilling water of the Pacific. To complicate matters, there was a dense fog over the entire area that day, which made it impossible for her to see the California coast. After about 15 hours in the water and with just a half a mile short of her goal, 
Chadwick gave up. Later, she told a reporter, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen the land, I might have made it. How true is that when it comes to this journey we call the Christian life? In Acts 14, we're told that Barnabas and Paul revisited some of the churches that they had planted in order to encourage the new believers. And they encouraged them with the sober reminder that it is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. Perhaps some of these new believers assumed that in coming to Christ, all their problems would now go away and the way forward would be smooth sailing. Not so, Paul says. From the moment that we are effectually called by God and we put our faith in Christ, we enter not a sprint, a quick dash to the finish line. The Christian life is more like a marathon. And marathons are long. They are grueling. They are exhausting, taxing every ounce of strength. <clears throat> but what keeps the runner plodding forward when the muscles cramp up and when the knees are sore and when exhaustion sets in? What keeps her putting one foot in front of the other? Is it not in part the promise of what awaits her when the race is finished and she receives that prize of the victor's crown? And so it is with the Christian. What awaits the believer is the trophy, salvation in all of its fullness when we shall be made like Christ, perfect in his presence. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Friends, the Bible does not sugarcoat the Christian life. After all, Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians while he was imprisoned in Rome. Earlier in verse 10, he speaks of the privilege of sharing in Christ's sufferings. But what encourages believers in the midst of those trials is the assurance of what awaits them at the finished line. Let the joy of heaven and God's presence forever be your encouragement, not just in your dying moments, but let it also give joy to your soul and strength to your step even now as you press on. Finally, the Christian life is marked by growing maturity, growing maturity. Paul writes in verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. As I mentioned earlier, the word mature here is the same word translated as perfect in verse 12. Now, by identifying himself here as mature, Paul is not suggesting that he has already been made perfect. He's already said that he hasn't. That still awaits him in glory. But he is mature in the sense that his life in Christ is growing in faith and steadily progressing to God's appointed end. And such is the goal of every believer, that we are fully engaged in the work of sanctification, intentional in our efforts, always looking forward, never losing sight of the prize that awaits us. Paul says, those who are mature think this way. As I said at the beginning, a spiritually static or regressing Christian is a contradiction because a true disciple of Christ is one who is continually growing in grace, being shaped and conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Imagine for a moment that you go out to eat at a nice steak restaurant with a group of people from your workplace. And when the waiter comes over to take the order, everyone orders a nice, big, juicy steak, except the new guy. And he says to the waiter, oh, no, no, nothing for me. I brought my own. And then 
he pulls out a bag with a baby bottle filled with milk and a jar of mashed peas and a cup of applesauce and some goldfish crackers and he begins to eat. Can you imagine that? Well, of course you can. It's ridiculous. A grown man eating a diet like that, it makes no sense. Except on a spiritual level, that is exactly what happens when those who profess to be believers show no signs of growth. Just read Hebrews chapter 6. A true Christian is a growing Christian who is advancing, maturing, so that Christ in him or her is coming clearer into focus. Friends, if you are here today and you are not a believer, you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, confessing him as your only Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you today to do that and to begin this journey that we call the Christian life. It is a journey in which you will be made more and more into the likeness of Jesus until that day when you enter into his presence and are glorified, perfect in holiness. And if you are a Christian, I simply want to encourage you to keep going, keep progressing forward, never lose sight of the prize. At the foot of one of the Swiss Alps is a marker honoring a man who fell to his death attempting the ascent. The marker gives his name and then this brief epitaph, he died climbing. The epitaph of every Christian should be that by God's grace they died climbing the upward path toward the prize of being made like Christ in all holiness and thus sharing his fellowship for all eternity. Let's pray. Loving God, you are <coughs> you are the one who has predestined your elect to be holy and blameless in your sight. And so we pray that you would grow us in this grace. With Paul, help us to keep pressing forward in maturity to the prize that awaits us when we shall be made like our Savior in glory. Sustain us daily by your grace, even as we avail ourselves daily of your means of grace in word and sacrament and prayer. Guard us against the barrenness of a busy life. and Teach us to pursue the holiness of our life in Christ with single-minded devotion Enjoy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would take out your hymn book one last time and let's turn to number 598 Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Please stand with me.
Thank you so much for being in worship this morning. Please come back and join us again tonight at 5 o'clock for our evening worship service and close out the Lord's Day in, in praising Him. Also, I do need to remind the uh, elders of the church, we do have a brief meeting uh, immediately after the benediction in the choir room. Let's receive now God's good word, his benediction to us today. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen.